This is near and dear to my heart. I, I've been active in parental choice, uh, in education for decades, uh, having been a chairman of an independent school. Uh, and we really moved the ball forward here in this last couple of couple of sessions. Uh, we uh, ha we dramatically expanded our Big Sky scholarships, which is a tax credit scholarship for lower income kids. We, for the first time in the history of the state, we now have a educational savings account for children with disabilities. Uh, we also enacted uh, charter school legislation for the first time. Uh, we've revamped our digital academy. Uh, we increased public teacher pay, which was too low. Uh, but at the end of the day, here's the bottom line. Parents know what's best for their kids, and that's why we've given them more choices to make sure that every child can reach their full potential. Uh, parental choice in education is really central to that theme. Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. All right, thanks for joining us for another episode of American Potential. You know, nestled in the heart of the American West is a state renowned for its rugged landscapes, expansive wilderness, its rich cultural heritage, and a state which has a governor who is focused on making the state a better place to work and to live. Now, some of the key issues he's focused on are the economy, education, and housing. Some of his accomplishments so far have been to simplify the tax code, effectively eliminating the state's debt and removing red tape to foster a more business-friendly environment. Now, he started his first business while he was still in high school. And ever since then, he's focused on being a job creator. One of the ways he's done this is by being the founder of five startups which resulted in well-paying jobs for employees. And after being in the private sector for 34 years, he decided it was time to enter the political arena, and he ran for the state's at-large congressional seat, and he won. He was later elected governor in 2020 and has been focused on making the state better for the people that live there, while also trying to bring people back to the state. I want to welcome Montana's governor, Greg Gianforte, to the show. Governor, thanks for being with us. Jeff, my pleasure. Yes. Yeah, so, okay, first of all, you fell in love with Montana during a school trip. Now, I got to hear that story. Well, that was 48 years ago. I was a ninth grader growing up in Pennsylvania, and I had a junior high school science teacher who had flown P-51s in World War II and trained in Montana. Uh, he, the only, he fell in love first, and the only way he could get here every summer on a public school teacher's salary was to bring two van loads of ninth graders with him. So we drove <laughs> all the way from Pennsylvania to Red Lodge, Montana in 1976. And uh, it just shows you the impact a teacher can have. Four people on that trip ended up moving here to Montana. <laughs> and one of them became the governor. <laughs> yeah. So that that's quite an impact. That's for sure. All right. Now, you've been uh, a very successful business leader, businessman. Why did you decide that you wanted to run for, for office? Well, really two reasons. One, uh, Montana was not living up to its full potential and we needed business leadership to create more jobs so our kids and grandkids don't have to leave. And secondly, uh, to protect this incredible way of life we have here. Those were the things that motivated my wife and I have been incredibly blessed. Uh, we've lived the American dream. And it was our turn to give back and serve the great people of Montana. So, you know, we've done an episode. We did an episode on this podcast on the housing reform that's been passed in Montana. And it, it's, you know, it's really a model for other states to, to take a look at. And Montana kind of led the way in this and you led the way in it. Why was it important to focus on that issue and talk about some of the results of those changes? Sure. I, I, I think affordability of housing, it's central to the American dream. Uh, and yet we had communities growing in such a way that housing was not attainable. It was not affordable. Prices were going up and in part because we had so many people moving here uh, and we had to do something about it. Uh, we also recognized that this problem was so big, there was no government program that was going to buy our way out of it. Uh, we took a free market approach. 
I formed a bipartisan uh, task force on housing, and we looked at the recognizing this is primarily a supply problem. Uh, we worked to increase supply and to remove friction. Uh, we learned in that analysis that 40% of the cost of a new home is government regulations. So we streamlined permitting. We got rid of exclusionary zoning. Uh, we restored property rights and allowed homeowners to build multifamily homes, to put uh, residents' uh, apartments in commercial districts. We authorized ADUs, auxiliary dwelling units. Uh, we also learned that all of the existing infrastructure funds that were available were restricted to urban renewal. They only allowed you to replace aging water and sewer systems. Uh, so we, out of our surplus, we created, uh, we, uh, uh, we asked for $200 million in a low interest revolving loan fund that would fund new water and sewer for subdivisions provided there were at least 10 units per acre. Uh, we also changed our apprenticeship rules to increase the number of carpenters and plumbers. And we're getting results in two of our larger communities. Uh, we've already seen vacancy rates on apartments go up significantly from a very constricted 1% uh, to over 6%. And we've seen uh, rental rates on apartments come down about 20% in some of our larger markets. So these free market approaches have worked. Well, you know, that's one of the things that this show is about. It's about removing government imposed barriers. And, and you know, the government in, in so many ways, whether it's the local government, state government, or the, certainly the federal government creates these barriers. And, and you know, the biggest barrier, uh, barrier of all is inflation that's being driven by the federal government and the overspending there. But th this is such a great example of how a governor and a, and a legislature buying into that and, and, and you leading as governor can, can really make a difference in people's lives, removing those barriers. Are there other areas in Montana where you've done that as well? Well, we, I, I think that individual Montanans can spend uh, their money better than the government can. That's why, uh, we we enacted really conservative fiscal policies in 2021. Uh, we passed a budget that held the line on new spending. We funded all the essential services, uh, but we kept government spending growth to less than 1% in 2021, in 2022. That brought us into the 2023 legislative session with a huge surplus. We had uh, a two and a half billion dollar surplus on a budget that was only about five billion dollars total so a 50 percent surplus uh, we did a couple of uh, important things with that first recognize that it's not the state's money we gave over a billion dollars back to the people of montana in one-time uh, tax rebates but also uh, we permanently reduced tax rates uh, going forward so now we have the fourth lowest capital gains rate in the country we took 5,000 small businesses off the business equipment tax rolls by increasing the exemption to a million dollars for every business, and we lowered our income tax rate. The second thing we did with the surplus was we fixed what was broken. Our uh, prior administrations have been kicking the can down the road, so we fixed our prison. We invested in behavioral health. We put a lot of money into roads and bridges. We still had money left over, so we doubled our rainy day fund. And then we still had money left over, so we paid off all of our state debt. And I'm proud to tell you, Montana is now completely debt free. Well, and th these are these are revolutionary changes that you've made. And I'll tell you, one of the things I really love about this story is that lots of times when politicians or you know governors or uh, uh, state legislatures find more money, they spend the money. But but uh, you did spend some of it. But you looked at this as an opportunity to really get this tax reform and really set Montana up for future growth and, and the, the, the future, didn't you? Yeah, we did some investing, but I will say uh, we invested in capital projects primarily related to maintenance. These are one-time right. expenses. What we didn't want to do is plant acorns that grow mighty oaks that will have to need care and feeding uh, uh, on, the, on behalf of our children and grandchildren. So. We used one-time money 
to take care of one-time expenses and didn't grow the ongoing cost of government. Uh, let me ask you about uh, school, school choice, and one of the areas we talk about a lot is vouchers. And, um, you know, they used to be called vouchers, but the, the, let's talk about the uh, the barriers that government puts in kids' way, in K-12 through education particularly. We limit them in so many ways to zip codes. And uh, if, you're bo- if you live in this zip code, that's the school you'd go to. What, what do you see in Montana as the future of education? Yeah, so this is near and dear to my heart. I, I've been active in parental choice uh, in education for decades, uh, having been a chairman of an independent school. Uh, and we really moved the ball forward here in this last couple of couple of sessions. Uh, we, uh, ha- we dramatically expanded our Big Sky Scholarships, which is a tax credit scholarship for lower income kids. We, for the first time in the history of the state, we now have a educational savings account for children with disabilities. Uh, We also enacted uh, charter school legislation for the first time. Uh, We've revamped our digital academy. Uh, We increased public teacher pay, which was too low. Uh, But at the end of the day, here's the bottom line. Parents know what's best for their kids. And that's why we've given them more choices to make sure that every child can reach their full potential. Uh, parental choice in education is really central to that theme. It seems to me that many states over, well, particularly since COVID, I mean, COVID really changed the way education is delivered or the way it will be delivered, at least in the future. It seems like uh, parents saw that as an opportunity to really say, look, I want to take control of my kids' education. It seems there's lots of states that are passing reforms in education, and then there are other states that are resistant to it. Don't you believe that states that enact these reforms, these sort of free market reforms in education, they're going to be set up for the future and states that resist them, they're going to have a hard time competing with the states that have made these reforms? Yeah, I mean, as parents, we know no two children are the same. They don't learn the same. And that's why a one size fits all approach in education just doesn't work. It doesn't produce the best result. I think that Guiding light in education has to be to help every child reach their full potential. Uh, And different kids learn in different ways. That's why we've advanced charters, why we're doing educational savings accounts, why we have tax credit scholarships. These are all part of creating a competitive marketplace of education. Uh, In the end, the kids win. So Montana is a, it's a great state. I love visiting Montana. Uh, I, I will tell you one of the things that always strikes me I live in Colorado, and of course, Colorado Springs is about an hour south of Denver. That's where I live in Colorado Springs. But man, Montana, you have cities that are good-sized cities, but they're all spread out. They're, everything's, I tell folks, everything's two to three hours away in Montana from, from any other city. That's got to be a challenge, I think, for, for the state, for the state government, for you as governor. Is, I mean, do you, is that a challenge for you? But it, it, it sure is. I mean, uh, as our former senator used to say in Montana, there's a lot of dirt between the light bulbs. And just <laughs> for people that are watching and listening, uh, let me put it in perspective. You can get in your car in Washington, D.C. and drive to Chicago, Illinois, and you're still in Montana. Wow. We're the fourth largest state in the country with just over a million people. Uh, So uh, we, you know, people say, oh, well, that's rural. Well, we have rural communities, but we also have frontier communities. I've been in K through 12 schools that don't have 50 children in K through 12. The the demands in those sorts of communities to provide a top-notch education are challenging. That's why we've been investing in digital delivery of education. We've reformed this so that if the next Einstein is born in one of these frontier communities, uh, we can be sure that they have the best physics teacher or calculus teacher. And if the next Beethoven is vote, uh, born in one of these frontier communities, they have great uh, music composition instruction. Uh, with digital delivery, that allows that, but it, it means we have to change the way we do the classroom. Uh, we Teachers are essential, uh, but they become more of educational coaches to help students reach their full potential while bringing in subject matter experts 
to make sure we have a full complement of coursework. Yeah. How does that affect uh, your transportation funding? I would assume that, that, that that's a challenge as well when you have these cities that are so far away from each other. It does. I mean, we uh, most of the highway uh, construction stuff is funded with uh, federal, federal highway funds. Uh, our, of course, our tax dollars come here. Fortunately, a lot of people come and visit here in the summertime, and most of the, the gas tax that's pit spent buying uh, gasoline and diesel, uh, that goes back into our road system. So uh, we did take the opportunity of having a surplus of putting uh, about $200 million into roads and bridges. Half of that went to county roads and bridges. The other half went to state roads and bridges. And it was structured in such a way that we could get uh, a match from the federal government. So that makes those dollars go a lot further. So we have to be good stewards. I think it, at the end of the day, the role of government should be limited. Uh, but one of the purposes of government is to provide infrastructure that can't be paid for in any other way. And roads and bridges certainly falls in that category. Now, Montana's population's grown pretty significantly in the last uh, couple of years, particularly since COVID, I think. And there have been an increase in property values uh, uh, and, and property taxes. How, have you addressed that? How have you tried to address a rising property tax issue? Yeah, our, our, our property taxes are too high. I'll be the first one to say that. And in Montana, property taxes fund local expenses. The state doesn't receive any of the property taxes. And what should happen is as property values go up, the tax rate that local property owners pay should go down. Um, but we've had spending at the local level that's grown faster than inflation over the last 20 years. Inflation's been about 2.4% per year over that 20 years. Inflation has been 2.4 per year, but local spending has gone up 6% per year over that same period. So we are seeing higher property taxes primarily related to local spending, whether that's uh, uh, mill levies that voters vote for tree districts and swimming pools and county parks and that stuff, as well as the sheriff's office and education. Uh, so uh, we did two things. One, in this last session, we took some of our surplus and we sent every Montana homeowner a check for a little over $1,300 as a property tax rebate if it's your primary residence. So that provided some immediate relief, but we've got to fix the problem going forward. So just like we did in housing, I formed a bipartisan property tax task force. They are meeting now. Uh, we'll get their report over the course of the summer, uh, and hopefully we can get those proposals in front of the legislature in early 2025. Now, you've also done some spending reforms. Let's talk about uh, some of the spending reforms that you, you passed as well. Well, we've just held the line on new spending. I mean, it's not that complicated. It's just uh, we... <laughs> We had to get. You might under tell them in Washington, Governor. You might tell them in Washington that it's not that complicated because they seem to think it is. <laughs> well, having spent decades in the private sector, and and honestly, every homeowner has to, every every household has to balance their checkbook every month. And we do have a constitutional amendment that requires a balanced budget. Uh, but as as you noted, coming into a legislative session with a large surplus, uh, there's a lot of appetite on both the conservative side and the liberal side to spend it all. Uh, and we just had to resist that. We did. Uh, we kept uh, you know, permanent growth in spending to a minimum. Uh, we had to take care of our state employees. We had, to, we had some statutory requirements for increases, but we did not want to plant any new acorns uh, to grow these mighty oaks. And uh, we did that successfully, and we'll continue to hold the line on new spending. Now, since, you, uh, since you've taken office... You've also led an effort to reduce red tape. Has it, have you been successful in that? And have you been able to attack, uh, attract new businesses as a result of that? Yeah, so the answer is yes. Uh, this, was, this initiative was head, headed up by our lieutenant governor, uh, Kristen Juris. She spent 40 years practicing law in the private sector, representing Main Street businesses and farms and ranches. So she knew where all the friction was. So we've initiated a process where we've gone through every line of every regulation in every agency, and I signed nearly 200 
red tape relief bills into law this last legislative session, that touched almost 20% of all the regulations in the state. As an example, one of the things we did actually through a rulemaking change, we changed our apprenticeship ratios. We used to require that every apprentice be supervised by two journeymen, and it was really a restraint of trade. We flipped that. And now in Montana, one journeyman can supervise two apprentices. Of course, a teacher can teach two students. That change alone has quadrupled the number of apprenticeship slots we've had, and we're seeing a response. And if you want more houses, you need more carpenters. So having carpentry apprentices allows that to happen. And we've been uh, seeing that show up in business relocations. We just uh, uh, won a two-year competitive process with 22 other states for a VACOM. This is a German manufacturer in the semiconductor industry. They're going to locate in Lewistown, Montana, and hire 500 people over the next five years. Uh, Brickstale Defense is coming to Glendive. They're making a $125 million investment, hiring 350 people. Duvel, uh, a manufactured home company, we recruited them into Butte Silver Bowl. They're going to hire 450 people. Uh, Montana is open for business, uh, and in other states, you're going to face more red tape and higher taxes. In Montana, we let you keep the fruits of your labor, and we're going to try to the best of our ability to stay out of your way unless there's a public safety involve, issue involved or the environment's involved. The last thing I'll mention in that regard is we did also pass a new tax reform. We call it the entrepreneur magnet. In Montana now, if you if Montana is your legit corporate headquarters and you hire at least 25 people here and you operate for a period of time, there is zero tax on the sale of corporate stock. We want entrepreneurs to flock to Montana like the golden geese, the entrepreneurial golden geese, and then lay golden W-2 eggs. Uh, and that's what this bill is all about. And that's very appealing to entrepreneurs to be able to keep the fruits of their labor. Well, it's remarkable what you've been doing. And I, you know, I, I just conjure up visions of the difference between Montana and say California, or many of these other states that are moving in the completely wrong direction. Montana is for sure moving in the right direction under your leadership. You've got a lot of Montanans who, you know, grew up in Montana, but had to leave the state. Are you trying to get some of them to move back to Montana? We are. We did some research and we, we identified 120,000 people that uh, either grew up here or went to college here who no longer have a Montana address. So uh, we've been bombarding them with social media and direct mail. And it's really not a fair fight because we <laughs> mail them brochures with people floating the rivers and skiing the hills and hiking the mountains and picnicking with families. And they're trapped in these concrete jungles. Uh, they know the quality of life and we want them to come home and bring their Montana values with them. So we've been targeting these people and it's been successful. And I, you make a contrast between us and other states like California. Uh, we now have business attraction individuals in California, Colorado, and the Midwest. And it's not hard in California. You just knock on the door of a business owner and say, do you want to move back to America? <laughs> and we get a very positive response. Yeah, I, I'm sure you do. And I, it is amazing how much growth you've had uh, in Montana. Last question. You've done so many great things uh, as governor. You've been able to accomplish so much. What do you hope still to accomplish uh, before you leave office as, as governor of Montana? Yeah, so there aren't going to be big surprises. I'm a business guy. We have to continue to be vigilant in peeling back red tape. Uh, I think as we continue to constrain the growth of government, uh, surpluses should be applied to lower tax rates for all Montanans. Uh, and uh, I, as I often say, I think football games are won with three to five yard plays. We've run a bunch of plays. We've put a bunch of points up on the board, uh, but we still have a few plays in the playbook. Well, I know you do. And I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to spend with us to kind of highlight some of the great reforms you've done in Montana. Governor, thank you for being with us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Great. Thank you.
Well, Governor Gianforte is doing great things in the state of Montana. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of governors who could hear that interview and find some great policy initiatives that they could advance. You know, I, I just have to give him credit for being a governor who he just hasn't taken his foot off the gas, right? He could say, well, I passed this and that's my signature thing. He's still trying to find more reforms to make Montana an even better place. And you can see the growth. I mean, we talk about this all the time, that states are are mini laboratories. And where freedom and liberty is flourishing, we see people flocking to those places. Where it's not, and there's excess uh, regulation, excess taxation, and government getting too involved in people's lives in a state, people are fleeing that state, and they're heading to other places. People in America still have a choice in where they live. And because we're a constitutional republic of 50 states and these experimental labs, as I mentioned, people can choose to go to different states. California finds that out on a daily basis. People are fleeing the state of California and are going to other freedom-loving states like Montana. So it was great to have Governor Gianforte uh, be on the show with us to highlight some of the great things, some of the housing Things that they did actually revolutionary. And there will be many other states, I think, in the coming years that look to Montana and say, we're going to do exactly what Montana did so that we can make housing more affordable for young families and let them stay here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to this show about the great state of Montana. And thanks for being with us. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com.